see my screen. Can you hear me? Research methods and methodology. Warm greetings to everyone. So this evening we shall talk about the fundamentals of methodology and methods. This is the outline. We shall be discussing seven topics, among which are the following. Methodology in relation to methods, research design, sampling techniques, data collection methods, data analysis, validity and reliability, research ethics. Introduction. So we shall look at the following. Every time we embark on research, we are one step closer to unlocking the understanding of a given phenomenon. Each research effort serves as an affirmation of the immense power of discovering new knowledge. Within the vast arena of knowledge acquisition and exploration, each research problem presents a chance to unlock fresh perspective. Embrace the boundless possibilities of academia and let your curious nature paint a path towards discovery. The thrill of pursuing knowledge and exploration lies not only in reaching a goal, but also in the remarkable voyage of growth and change along the way. Keep in mind, as you set off on your research adventure, that every inquiry holds a promise of revolutionary discovery. Now we shall look into methodology in relation to methods. What is the difference between methods and methodology? Uh, for one, research methodology is a systematic framework. It provides the bigger picture. It shows you the whole process uh, by which you shall conduct your research. It provides the philosophy, the theory, the concepts, the overall approach, and the structure will depend on, do you want your paper to be qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods? It depends very much on the objective of your paper. On the other hand, research methods are very specific techniques, things that you have to do step by step come in and this focuses on the practical aspect of data gathering and analysis. Come in, please. Somebody, please hold on. Yes? I have Zoom meeting. Huh? Oh, motorcycle. Uh, the I'm at the university and I was warned it will be closed. It's vacation time now. Uh, it's uh, nine o'clock in, uh, 8.30 in Thailand. So I have to leave immediately after I finish. Apologies. Uh, the security guard came. So when you talk of research methods, we're talking of specific uh, ways by which we will do our work. This will be the procedures. Step one, step two, step three. So we're looking at very specific, uh, concrete, practical steps. And we have to choose what type of methods will be best for our study. In summary, uh, you can see in this chart, while methodology looks at the big picture, methods look at specific techniques. And methodology looks at the philosophical, the theoretical, the conceptual uh, spheres of your study. Methods look at the practical steps. And when you do methodology, you have to choose qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods. And in, in, on the method side, you're looking at specific methods. We shall discuss them as we go along. Now, on um, the third topic, so which would be the appropriate research design for your study? There are many things we have to consider. So one, there is qualitative research design. Two, there's quantitative. Three, there is mixed methods. Qualitative research looks for alphabets, letters, words. Quantitative looks for numbers. So when you do mixed methods, it's alphanumeric. 
It's a combination of both. So in broad three, those are the three different research designs. And, but there are differences as well, how we can see. A qualitative research design looks for words, meanings, uh, interpretation, or understanding, and stories. Whereas quantitative research design looks for numbers, statistics, and the data must be quantifiable. You cannot just say, I'm happy. Uh, that would be qualitative. The type of quantitative research design, the answer you look for is, to what extent are you happy from a scale of zero to 10 or zero to five? So, and then you would say, how many percent of people uh, feel that they are happy at a certain given point in time? So the resort, uh, research findings will be very different. So objective of the re qualitative research design is to understand a deeply uh, complex phenomenon. Whereas in quantitative research design, we are testing hypotheses and there's a possibility to forecast what will happen in the future based on existing measurable quantifiable trend. For example, we can say in the Northern hemisphere, for March, April, May, June, that in more or less, that would be springtime. July, August, September, October, more or less would be autumn or fall. November, December, January, February, more or less, uh, we will be in winter time. It will be the reverse uh, in the Southern hemisphere. So uh, quantitatively, we know there are there's a cycle, things can happen. But when you look at qualitative, you're looking at what do how do people feel when it's hot, when it's humid, when it's raining. So you look for deeper meaning. And for the research questions, in qualitative research, you ask open-ended questions. And sometimes you don't have fixed questions. Whereas in quantitative research, they have to be fixed from the start. Before you go out and conduct your research, you must already have certain questions to which you expect to have answers. And they are fixed because you want to quantify and to measure the responses. For data collection, briefly, uh, for the qualitative, you go for interviews, focus group, and observation. We'll discuss that deeper later. And for quantitative, it's uh, going through surveys, experiments, and close-ended questions. So you want to say, are you happy? Uh, do you go to school? Do you have a master's degree? So it's very fixed, yes or no, uh, or to what extent uh, is your family united? So you have to give scale of zero to 10. You have to choose a number. You cannot just give a long answer. That will be for qualitative, you give a long answer. For data analysis, in qualitative research, you want to look for themes. You code either by hand or by computer programs. Software such as Envivo, Nudis, uh, there are many other uh, qualitative uh, tools that you can use for data analysis. For quantitative, it's basically statistics, numbers. So you can use SAS, SPSS, R, there are many other programs now both uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, available publicly for free, freeware, or those which are proprietary uh, products. So you can use different tools to do data analysis. And when you, you talk of validity and reliability, we'll go deeper later. That, those are vocabulary specifically for quantitative research. Uh, if you use qualitative study, those are not the words you use. The words you use are uh, transferability, consistency, dependability. They are related, they are parallel, but to make a distinction between qualitative and quantitative, the vocabulary uh, for both are very different. Okay. And for qualitative research, it's flexible. You can change your research question when you go out to the field after realizing that you cannot, in fact, ask those questions because they are the wrong questions you're asking. But for quantitative research, they are fixed from the start. Before you conduct your research, it must already be fixed. 
uh, no changes are allowed. So more or less, that's the structure. A quantitative is more rigid, whereas qualitative uh, research design can be changed depending on the availability of research findings in the field when you go out to the field. And the role of the researcher is primary in qualitative research. You are an instrument of research, but in quantitative research, you maintain what you call as objectivity. You try to be as distant from the findings, unlike in the qualitative research, you are part of the research. And uh, oftentimes qualitative research is done in the social sciences, but they're also used in business, uh, especially Harvard Business School. They're, they're using qualitative research and they're using case study uh, in their journal, uh, Harvard uh, Business School. And quantitative is mostly used in medicine, uh, in engineering, in biology, in chemistry, and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, in areas where you need measurement and exact figures, like knowing the efficacy of the vaccines, uh, A, B, C, D, different vaccines. You have to test 30,000 people, for instance, to find out whether the vaccine will cause side effects, negative side effects or not, okay? So here in broad sweep, we can see that qualitative research goes for deep thick description. There's a term of Clifford Geertz, who is a noted uh, ethnographer and anthropologist who coined the term thick description. You want to go deep and find out how people think, how people live, and what they do in their daily lives. Whereas in quantitative research design, you're looking for numbers. Okay? But for mixed methods, it's a combination. We'll go again uh, deeper into that. I'm giving you some examples of some of the articles I've written and how I have used them. Uh, both qualitative and quantitative and mixed method. Okay. I've written a few articles on the Ukraine-Russia conflict, and uh, all of them are qualitative, but I've used different uh, research methods, case study, ethnography, and observation. As also field visit, I I've been to Ukraine for a month before the conflict, document analysis, public witness, uh, I was there, I was all over the country and dialogue with the people. And I did narrative analysis for my paper. This is one publication uh, in, in Turkey. The three narratives, I used the narrative analysis of the Ukraine crisis and the perspectives of conflict and peace studies. I wrote another paper uh, in the most prestigious institution in Thailand where I am based, NIDA, National uh, National Institute of Development Administration, post-Ukraine crisis world order, turning challenges into opportunities towards inclusive growth in the global economy. A third paper I wrote, published in the US, Journal of Research for International Educators, Russia's Special Military Operation in Ukraine. Again, I use the narrative analysis. Divergent narratives of the conflict Conflict Transformation and Peace Building. A fourth paper uh, published in a university in Southern Thailand. I am in Northern Thailand. Post-Ukraine Crisis World Order, Alternative Futures in the International Political Economy. Okay, so those are some examples of, of what I've written only in relation to Ukraine and Russia conflict. But you can also use qualitative research design in business, organizational development, political science, the different social sciences, engineering, economics, education, history, sociology, psychology, linguistics, English literature, communication arts, humanities, management, and human resources. And I've given some case studies and examples of how they can be used. And also for the quantitative, it's the same. You can use 
both qualitative or quantitative in doing different uh, research in the different fields. I, I've given examples here. Now, for the sampling techniques, so what are the different sampling techniques? Again, just like research design, uh, you also have uh, different sampling techniques. For qualitative research, quantitative research, and mixed methods research. And the, again, the vocabulary is very different. So we have to be careful when we use vocabulary when you write our papers, depending on whether they are qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods. Okay, here, uh, there are strengths and weaknesses for the qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods. Qualitative sampling, uh, we are looking for some people, uh, we're not looking for specific measurement of uh, generalizability, we cannot generalize when we do qualitative sampling, but we want to get deep insights. For example, Harvard Business School, I would interview one manager or one CEO and get deep insights. Why is your company a success? after it went bankrupt. So it will interview one person. And then the whole research is about that one person, one CEO or one uh, manager. And then they might follow the manager for a year, a month, or have a series of interviews. But that cannot be generalized. That's the weakness. It's subjective because you're looking from the point of view of one person because the CEO may have a very different view from the workers, from the factory workers, from the white collar staff in the offices. Okay, so it, you cannot generalize, the but you can get very rich information why this business succeeds after it went bankrupt. So some methods used are open-ended questions and interview. For quantitative research, you are not, going to be involved as a subjective researcher. You want to be as generalizable as possible and you get as many sources of information as you can. Not only the CEO, but also some uh, office workers, some factory workers, some pink collar workers, the receptionists, the clerks, the librarians, the blue collar in the offices, I'm sorry, in the factory, the white collar in the offices. The problem though is you can only get very uh, uh, shallow information. You're not after depth. You want to get big picture and big numbers. How many percent of the factory workers say the CEO does not care about them? How many percent of the white collar staff at the office are admire the CEO? And so on and so forth. So you just get 50%, 62%, and so on. So oftentimes it's survey. So you conduct big survey. Uh, in the past, it's written or telephone. Nowadays, it's online. You can answer the survey questionnaire in your smartphone. Uh, you have a QR code and you answer it on the spot. Okay, so, but if you do mix method, you combine the two. So you would use <clears throat> both. Uh, open-ended questions, and also survey. But there are two types. One is called sequential, which means you will do one before the other. There's no right or wrong, but oftentimes people start with survey. And then after the survey, you want to go deep, that's quantitative, you go qualitative. So you want to have interviews after you have the survey. Or you can do the other way around. You first have interviews, and then after the interview, you get a feeling of how people think, then you want to go survey. But there's also something called concurrent mixed method. You do both quantita uh, quantitative survey and qualitative interview at the same time. It doesn't mean you as a person, but you and your team. You could have research assistants doing interview, at the same time, you have research assistants or associates who are doing survey. So it's concurrent, okay? So there are 
sequential, quality, and then quantity, or quantity and then quality, and then you have uh, concurrent. Both happen at the same time. Okay. So for qualitative sampling, you have purposive. Sometimes it's called pur uh, purposeful. Uh, you are selecting some people based on certain criteria. For example, you want to know how fathers uh, behave when they go home. So they have to be men and they have to be fathers, meaning they should have kids. Maybe they're divorced, but that's not your concern. Your concern is father. You didn't say husband. So you, you select men who, are, uh, who have children. Maybe you don't even care if they're married because it's not a criterion. The criterion is father and how they behave when they go home. So you have to make clear. Snowball is, for example, I want to interview uh, some uh, workers uh, who are producing chai, tea. Okay, So I, I'll go to Chaiwala in the street of uh, Madras. I say, do you know some Chaiwala who are in uh, in <clears throat> Uh, in, in, uh, in Chennai, fine. And and then I asked the people in Chennai, do you know another Chaiwala? Yeah, I do. So that is snowball. You want to interview, you don't know the people, but one person refers you to another. That is snowball sampling. <clears throat> or if you have a bigger research, for example, you want to look at how women's organization affect the livelihood of women. For example, widows. <clears throat> Then you would go to a women's organization, let's say in Delhi. And then you say, I want to also interview women's organization helping uh, women who are widows to have livelihood. Do you know, do you have some contacts in Calcutta? And then, yes, we do. And then they refer you to Calcutta. Then when you go to Calcutta, you say, oh, do you know some uh, people who are uh, or working in women's organization? helping uh, widows to have livelihood projects uh, in, let's say, in Nagaland. Say, oh yeah, I do. So that is snowball sampling. So you cannot generalize because they are selective based on people who know somebody else. The third one is convenience sampling. It simply means, okay, I want to know what people think about having at the same time a holiday uh, uh, in school, assuming it doesn't exist yet, maybe it already for uh, <clears throat> Ramadan, for Christmas, for Buddha's uh, Nirvana, and also a special holiday, and also for uh, the Hindu holidays. Okay, so you would ask people that you see when you're standing in the corner. Do you think it's good to have four holidays in a year for, of the different religions? So it's not representative. It's just the people you can contact in the street and people who are willing to answer your question. If they don't, you cannot force them. Okay, So that is called convenience sampling. Uh, you, you just stand in the corner. There's no measurement. There's no representativeness. None of these have representativeness. You cannot generalize your findings based on qualitative research. Theoretical sampling is you have some theory, either theory which you have used or theory which, had, uh, which is constructed uh, based on your research. Then you want to fit in, uh, interview some people and, uh, or you want to find out more. So it's based on your theoretical construct. For example, you want to say A is the cost, B is the effect. Then you would say, for example, if I go uh, and have some sweets, like kaju sweets, uh, and then will I gain uh, one kilogram if I eat kaju sweets every day? So you're looking for the relationship, but it's not representative. But you just want to show the relationship between the two, but not based on numerical findings, uh, strictly speaking, but on the variables or the elements that you have searched for. Does eating kaju sweets cost you to gain weight? 
Okay, so you have the two constructs that you have developed. Something's wrong with my computer. Electricity is not going. Okay, and this is an example of my qualitative research. There were eight international participants in a focus group, one Thai facilitator, total nine people. It's qualitative because we didn't do any testing or we didn't do regression and so on. It's non-random. These are people who are here, who are doing doctorate and who, who are in the area. This is in Northern Thailand. This is our, uh, our van on our way to go to the focus group. You have one person who's from Myanmar, one person is from the Philippines, one American, one Vietnamese, another from Myanmar, one me, one from the US, so two Americans, one from Nagaland, and this is the driver. Okay, so this is non-random. It's purposive because we have selected to go to do a, a focus group outside of our city in Chiang Mai, Northern Thailand. And it's convenience based on the availability of people. And we just ask around our circle. So whatever findings you will have, it's not representative. Okay, for quantitative, these are some of the major uh, types. Simple random. What we use when we use the term random in common language is different in quantitative sampling vocabulary. In everyday language, oh, I just randomly pick somebody. That means uh, I just pick anyone. But in quantitative research, random means there's a formula. And then in statistics, introduction to statistics books, <coughs> they usually have two pages of numbers. And that is where you get the random number. So this is not just, uh, oh, I just pick you. That is, that is called convenience. That is not called random. So in simple random, you get the numbers from a textbook, which are devised by statisticians and econometricians and giving everyone a chance to be selected, okay? Stratified means you say, for example, that, well, I want to look at high income, medium income, low income. So you subdivide the population. So you want to have equal representation, maybe. Or since the super rich is just 1%, then maybe you just have out of 100, only one super rich will interview. <clears throat> And if you're middle class, let's say 19%, for example, then you will want to get 19% of people who are middle income. And then if let's say 80% are poor, then you want to get 80% of the people who will answer your survey <clears throat> to be uh, from the poor sector. So it's stratified. Cluster means, for example, in the classroom, you have a people, 40 people. And you say, I will cluster you, whoever wears blue jeans, you are one group. Whoever wears skirt is another group. And whoever is wearing uh, not skirt and not blue jeans, you form another group. So you now have three clusters and people have, uh, you say, I want to choose two each from each group. Two, pe two persons wearing blue jeans, two persons who are wearing skirts and two persons who are not wearing jeans or, or blue jeans or skirts. Okay. Systematic is, for example, you have a whole cinema. Everyone's watching a movie in the theater. And you would say, uh, lights are out. We have special price for everyone. Please count off. <clears throat> and one to 10, and we go around one to 10 again. Okay, after everyone had counted, you would say, anyone who has the number nine, you win a prize. We will give you popcorn for everyone who, whose number is nine. So you, everyone has equal chance of being selected. Okay, that is uh, systematic. So you give a fixed order. And people sit as they sit, right? Or maybe they've reserved their seats. But the point is, you ask everyone uh, to call off from 1 to 10. 
And you decided nine would be the number uh, for which popcorn will be distributed for free. In mixed methods, uh, again, you can do two things. Uh, one is sequential, meaning you do quantitative first, like survey, and then you do qualitative interview. Or the other way is you do interview first qualitative, and then you do survey uh, quantitative. Concurrent is again at the same time. Uh, you do the uh, both qualitative and quantitative research. You, you can choose whichever way you want to do it. Again, you can have uh, stratified cluster, quota, or random sampling. And then in the qualitative stage of mixed method, uh, you can select based on uh, what do you decide? Like, again, we want women who have children but are not married or who are widows. So you, you make certain criteria, and then that's the criteria which will guide you in picking your sampling. Okay. Data collection <clears throat> methods. Again, as always, so it's qualitative, quantitative uh, data collection methods. Uh, in qualitative research, you have research purpose and research questions. In quantitative research, you have hypotheses. Hypothesis is used only in quantitative research. Normally, you want to say the higher the A, the higher the B, or if A, then B, or A causes B. Uh, y is a function of X. So that's those are hypothetical relationships. You have independent variable, dependent variable as a minimum, and there are many other variables in between. For qualitative, you have research questions. Sometimes in quantitative research, they also ask research questions. It depends on the tradition of the journal, of your university, of your faculty, of your department. <clears throat> For qualitative uh, research, you only want to understand and interpret human experiences and behavior. In quantitative research, you want to measure exactly and to what degree by using numbers. In qualitative research data collection, the most important of which are case studies. Again, remember Harvard Business School uses case studies. It's very qualitative. Ethnography, uh, also business schools also use ethnography to learn about the new fashion, big companies, uh, fashion industry, go and look for the hippest, the most fashionable young people in high school. They follow them, they see what they dress so differently, they make their new statement. That is ethnographic research. And they try to see what makes this fashion uh, a good sense, a good fashion sense. They follow TikTok, for example, and they find out and see these people. And then they come up with new fashion. Okay? Ethnography is used also in industry, especially for fashion industry. <clears throat> and case study for Harvard Business School or grounded theory. Nursing uh, colleges use grounded theory a lot. In fact, grounded theory was developed at uh, University of San Francisco uh, by nurses, including the fathers of grounded theory who are in the nursing theory. Quantitative research does experimental, quasi-experimental, or survey research design. Again, uh, you want to know how efficacious a vaccine is, then you do 33,000 tests on vaccine A, on vaccine B, vaccine C, vaccine D, and see to what extent are they efficacious. 90 degree uh, percent, 60, uh, 40 percent, and then you'll, you'll see what, uh, which one is the best to be administered uh, to the children, to adults, to the general public. Okay, so <clears throat> For data gathering, uh, data collection is also known as data gathering. Uh, qualitative research does open-ended in-depth. So uh, oftentimes you just ask a big general question, although you have your research questions, uh, you can go around it and go beyond it and ask more questions. For quantitative, it's fixed. You want to say, are you male or female? Although that's controversial now in the US. 
uh, are you uh, high income, low income, medium income? And they'll give you a bracket. <clears throat> and which age group do you belong to? They would say uh, <clears throat> zero to 16, 17 to 21, 21 to 35, for example, 36 to 60, 61 and above. Then you have to pick one. Those are called close-ended questions. Okay, so unlike in qualitative, you don't do that uh, in general. For qualitative research, you want to find out why, for example, the CEO is such a big success. And, and some for magazines like uh, uh, Forbes uh, would, would come out and say, do you know that the super billionaires go and buy things in thrift shops? They buy bargains. Unlike the middle class who want to have the most expensive things to show off. So those, those are the findings based on qualitative research. That the richer the people are, the less is their need to show off their wealth. They already know they're rich. But the middle class want to show people they are rich. So they try to buy designer clothes, the big brand names. But the super rich, the billionaires don't care. Look at Mark Zuckerberg. He just wears, you know, a hoodie and blue jeans. And look at Steve Jobs, just black t-shirt and black pants. Unlike the young ones, the new rich, the middle class, I want to show they have uh, all of these big fashion names, Givenchy, Dior, Chanel, Versace. Uh, but the, the mega rich don't care, okay? And the richer they are, the billionaires, they don't have big screen TV on the wall. In fact, the super rich hide their small TVs in closets, specially made closets, uh, hardwood. Only when they want to watch it, no, they open it. But the new rich, this is based on qualitative research, not quantitative. And then you can read them in Forbes magazine, you know, to find out about the new trends and, you know, uh, where to invest. It's based on detailed interviews of people. And that's how you find out about the lives of the rich, the poor, the middle class, and so on. Okay. But for quantitative, you want to measure how many people <clears throat> will go and buy X, Y, Z. Okay. So you, you measure them. <clears throat> Okay, I made this graph, so it's a little easier to see. The more qualitative is on the left side, uh, focus group, interview, and observation. This is the X and Y axis, right, in simple uh, mathematics. <clears throat> and then the more quantitative, it's on the right side. You use experiment, quasi-experiment, health survey, how many people have flu, fever, typhoid, COVID, a household survey. But you use less context at the bottom part. It's just usually one shot. Uh, you interview one person usually once, twice, or three times. Focus group is usually one time. So the bottom part is less complex uh, context. But as you go up, there's more context. Uh, ethnography, if you want to understand the culture of a company, you have to go there like, shadow uh, uh, work, for example, for a month. You behave like you are an employee and the company knows you're doing this to know the business culture uh, inside that company. So that's ethnographic, more context. Phenomenology, you want to understand something. So you go deep into the experience. And action research, you work with the people uh, to, to bring about change. So you have to know what are the problems of the people, what are the problems in the community? Do they want change? What type of change do they want? In quantitative research, Harvard also had the longitudinal quantitative research about happiness. <clears throat> so this is, I don't know if it's 50, 60 year study. <clears throat> and they came out with the latest findings. They say uh, to be happy has nothing to do with money. So they interviewed people who were graduates in Massachusetts area. <clears throat> some have masters, some have doctorate, some are factory workers, but they followed them for like 40, 50 years. So that is longitudinal. 
uh, you look for trends and they found out that the happiest people are not the ones with the most number of money or the richest, rather the people who do something outside of work, like hobbies, okay? Maslow will call this self-fulfillment. Let's say you work uh, doing accounting every day, but you go out and you want to do painting for your own personal growth. So the Harvard Longitudinal Study showed that happiness is not based on wealth. One example is you do something outside of your routine. And two, you have people with whom you relate to on a daily basis. Whether you are married, single, divorced, or you're alone does not matter. If you talk with your neighbor or you have relationship with the, the chaiwala, you talk with people all the time, those are the happiest people. And they found out that even some of the happiest people are construction workers. So this is like 40, 50 years study. So to have meaning in life is you have companionship, you talk with people on a regular basis, you do fun things, what you think is fun. You don't go bowling because your wife, your husband tells you to go bowling. You do it because you love to do it. So that is longitudinal study, more context. So both qualitative and quantitative study can be less or more contextual, but qualitative is really, uh, quantitative, it looks for numbers. So in this long-term study on happiness, <clears throat> longitudinal survey, it look at the lives of people and they follow them year after year. So this professor <clears throat> had research assistants all Harvard students who graduated from Harvard will work with him and they follow these people and some have passed away. So it's a big, wonderful study. My sample of quantity of grounded theory. <clears throat> I wrote a paper, <clears throat> as I said, uh, um, four papers on Ukraine and Russia conflict. <clears throat> so this is, I said that there are three narratives about the Ukraine crisis the Ukraine narrative, the Russian narrative, and the NATO narrative. So there are contending narratives. So I use narrative analysis to study the Ukraine crisis. I did not say Ukraine is right. I did not say Russia is right. I did not say NATO is right. I gave three different views. There are three narratives of the Ukraine crisis. So that is my grounded theory. And this is another grounded theory in a book chapter published in Springer in October, uh, <clears throat> just uh, two months ago. This is, I talk about the role of spiritual leaders. What do they do? They do not <clears throat> convert people to, to belong to their religion, but they do certain things. <clears throat> uh, they care about peace, they care about women's rights and so on and so forth, okay? <clears throat> And then another grounded theory I wrote, <clears throat> this is uh, about uh, the power structure in the world, and then what do spiritual leaders do? And then what uh, what is their mission, number two? Three, what is the agency to change the system? And what is the outcome, social transformation? <clears throat> and some, uh, I've used case study, ethnography, phenomenology, and grounded theory in writing my four different articles about the Ukraine and Russia conflict. I, I did field visit. I was in Ukraine for about a month. I went from Kiev uh, uh, to Lvov, to Odessa, to Dnieper, okay, and then to back to Kiev. Then I went to Chernogiv, uh, here, Chernogiv, and then back to Kiev. Kiev is the capital. So I spent one month, about a month, right before the conflict. So I have a feel of the whole country. I've asked my friends what places I should visit to have a good view of Ukraine as a whole. Okay, so this is evidence. Uh, my host family in Ukraine, so I did ethnographic research. Uh, in Dnieper, and this is in 
Kiev, this is the capital where they had the big uh, uprising in 2014. Uh, and this is Lavrov, this is the big uh, ancient Orthodox church. And then uh, they were kicked out during the right now in the conflict. And then this is my guest in, I think, Odessa. So I, these are on all different places. So uh, when I did my field work, I stayed in different places, uh, in uh, Dnieper, in Lvov, in Kiev, uh, Dnieper, and then Kiev, and then in Lvov. So <clears throat> I was able to talk with people about the situation, the problems there, and I dialogue with uh, Alina, um, Sasha, Ala, Alexei, uh, Petra, Petrov, and Alexei again. So these are people from all over Ukraine with whom I had community. And this is in Thailand, in Northern Thailand. People who were here, uh, here uh, my friends from Belarus, from Russia, from Russia, from Russia, from Ukraine, from Russia, from Russia, from Ukraine. So I pretty much know the different points of view of the people. Uh, this is now phenomenological. I look deep into how do they find meaning in the conflict in Russia and Ukraine. So I did ethnographic research by doing field visit and then dialogue, I had interviews with them. And then uh, in Thailand, so these are the people with whom we even had the Russian Christmas at my place with the Russians uh, who prepared the dishes and uh, Belarus uh, and then another Ukrainian. So I was able to find out the different points of view. Belarus again, of course, sides with Russia in the conflict today. I was working in the US when I was doing my doctorate and I had Russian friend on the left a uh, Ukrainian friend, a co-worker, in fact, I'm sorry, they're all my co-workers. And then Russian co-worker, Ukrainian co-worker, her husband. And then when I left, a Russian replaced me at my office. And then these are the Ukrainian and Russian uh, in the West. And this is Yuri, uh, he was our guest speaker during the conflict. And this is the mother of our Ukrainian friend, and he's my Russian co-worker. So, so I was able to find out also their views. Okay, So from my experiences in Ukraine and having people with whom I'm uh, uh, acquainted with, I was able to write four papers with confidence because I've been there, I've interviewed people, I've done ethnographic research, I've done phenomenological understanding, and uh, I've done interviews. Another paper, uh, I did a focus group, uh, the earlier photo that I showed you uh, about uh, the people who are using the uh, purposive, non-random convenience sampling. Uh, we had the people who attended the, the workshop. This is the focus group actually happened outside Chiang Mai, the city where I live. And these are the raw data that we have on the whiteboard. From this, I was able to write an article which was published from our focus group about gender and power. Now, let's go to data analysis. As always, there's qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods data analysis. <clears throat> For Qualitative data analysis, we're looking for patterns and narratives. And there are about 11 or more methods in qualitative analysis. But the most famous one is the last one, thematic analysis. You want to find out what are the main themes that have emerged. You're concerned in doing qualitative research to have the subjective interpretation and you want to have the deep understanding of how people think, how people see their situation. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> these are the 11 data analysis methods. I could skip them for lack of time. And for quantitative data analysis, 
basically statistics. <clears throat> We're using descriptive statistics, inferential statistics, regression analysis, and hypothesis testing. Unlike qualitative, which is subjective, <clears throat> quantitative is objective. Qualitative findings are not generalizable. Quantitative research findings, if done correctly, are generalizable if you do the random sampling. And they're usually used in economics, in psychology, in uh, engineering, and so on. And they usually want to have graphs, histograms, pie charts, tables. Uh, this was required of me, that's why I put this here. Uh, when I submitted a journal article, I said there are three perspectives, three narratives, and I have to show what are the three. So there's a pro-war, the anti-war, or peace journalism, as I said, and the eyewitness reportage. So I said there are three different narratives about the conflict in uh, Ukraine. Okay, This is in a journal. Another sample of data analysis, this is in a journal published in the US, uh, Journal of Researchers in International Education. I was told I have to do data analysis, meaning come up with table and to prove that NATO was blaming Russia, Ukraine was blaming Russia, and Russia was blaming NATO. So I have to have the quotes on who said what. So I have evidence to show that, uh, in fact, there are three narratives. So this is, again, narrative analysis. This is another paper. I showed that after the Ukraine crisis, I said there are four possibilities that could happen. But this is this course. Narrative is people telling stories. This is how we think things can happen, the meaning we give. Unipolar means the US will still remain the dominant power in the world. Multipolar, you have China, India, Russia, South Africa, BRICS. And then you have non-alignment, countries who don't want to be caught between Russia or the US. We just say we're not aligned. But sometimes they're also part of the multipolar. And then there's another movement from the grassroots. Like We don't like multipolar. We don't like non-aligned. They're from the elite side. Grassroots will be the view of the people from, from below. The workers, the peasants, women's organizations, student organizations. Okay, So I said uh, in my paper, there are four discourses of what could happen after the Ukraine crisis ends, if it will end. But now we have the Gaza crisis going on. This is an example of qualitative descriptive statistics. Nothing special, but you just describe. Okay? You have five women, four men. These are the people. Uh, Myanmar, this is the focus group uh, uh, that we had discussion outside my city. Me, the, the instructor who's a Buddhist instructor, and then from Myanmar, an American, Vietnamese, an American, and somebody from the Philippines. So I just counted how many countries. Uh, you have people, nine total from eight countries, uh, five men and uh, four men and five women. And nothing special. This is called descriptive statistics. Okay. But Inferential statistics, uh, it's a kind of quantitative, but you're only looking for how many, okay, simple. But for inferential, you can make prediction based on current trend. Again, you would say, if the pressure of the air, the wind, and the humidity is X, Y, and Z, there's a high likelihood, 80%, that there will be monsoon rain that will take place. So you can make predictions. So in weather forecasting, they use inferential statistics. There's not 100% accuracy, but you can predict like 70, 80% things would happen. Regression analysis, there's a linear, there's nonlinear, there is multi-linear uh, uh, regression analysis. You're looking at 
does A affect B? Or do A, B, and C affect D? So you're looking at what are the causes and what is the effect? Okay, so that's regression. A hypothesis testing, you're looking at whether you can confirm that your hypothesis will be accepted or you fail to accept the hypothesis. You start with null hypothesis and then you have an alternative hypothesis. Okay, this will be for <clears throat> uh, uh, st quantitative statistical tests. For <clears throat> mixed method, we already discussed earlier, sequential and concurrent. Either one happens before another or at the same time you do the research. But uh, the advantage of mixed method is you can see from two points of view, the depth from the qualitative interviews or focus group and from the figures, the general trend in numbers. But this is difficult because you have to be expert in both qualitative and quantitative. Oftentimes, people are expert in one only, not in both. It's difficult to be expert in both. <clears throat> Another example, I, uh, this is one paper published. I said there are three narratives of the Maidan. <clears throat> Uh, protests in, in, in Ukraine, uh, in Kiev. Uh, one says it's a color revolution, it's democratic. Another says this is neo-Nazi uh, victory. And another say this is foreign intervention and coup. So <clears throat> I never give one answer. I always say there are multiple narratives. Okay? The same with uh, Ukraine crisis. NATO, uh, has one explanation why it's there. Ukraine is another explanation. Russia is another explanation. This is an example of mixed methods using random sampling with descriptive statistics that I've co-authored with two other professors, <clears throat> Thai professors. The advantage is uh, I am okay in qualitative research. Another professor is good in quantitative Dr. Benya, and another professor is good in interview. We're from three different departments. Dr. Benya is from the uh, Communication Art International College. Uh, uh, Dr. Witi Chula is from the business school, and I'm from the peace studies. Uh, so three different faculties, three different expertise, but we're able to come together to do a research. This is a year long research. We meet every week. Uh, to find out our research. So this is the mixed method that we did. A survey research, descriptive. Uh, total, we say that there are 315 faculty members, uh, excluding freshmen, because they don't have experience in quantitative, 1,632. And for the sampling, we use the Yamani formula. Out of 315, we have to uh, get survey responses from 222 faculty and 333 students with uh, uh, level of confidence 95 or error 5%. And we use convenient sampling. Okay? And participants are faculty and student. Since this is mixed method, we have both online and, and close, uh, online and in-person, open-ended and close-ended questions. Uh, we are using SPSS uh, for our data analysis. Okay, so we this is sequential: quantitative first online, qualitative uh, will follow qu interview followed by focus group, also qualitative. So three stages of data collection that we're doing, <clears throat> and the questionnaire has five point scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree, and the students must. Uh, be, have been enrolled during the pandemic. They have experiences in online learning and teaching, 20 to 21. Okay, we did pilot tests to test the reliability with the Cronbach's alpha coefficient for reliability. And for validity, uh, the questionnaires will be sent uh, to profession academics for them to check. Uh, this is peer uh, debriefing. Uh, of the instrument that we make sure that we have the correct research instrument. Okay, so this is done in 
both Thai language and English language. <clears throat> and these are the people. Okay, we do SPSS, descriptive statistics, percentages and mean, and then Cronbach's alpha coefficient, semi-structured open-ended in qualitative section of the, of the questionnaire, followed by interview and focus group discussion. So it's fixed methods. Okay, again, we have one expert in qualitative, one expert in quantitative, one expert in interview and focus group. So we are a good team uh, working together. <clears throat> so we collect our data, then we get the transcripts, then we code them, and then we have the focus group, code them, and then we'll write a report. Uh, we are almost done with uh, data collection in December. And then one faculty member will code the quantitative findings uh, this month and we'll do a presentation and then publication. This is a one year project. It started in May. Okay. Validity and reliability. <clears throat> For qualitative and quantitative and, and mixed method, the vocabulary again are different. Uh, be careful. The vocabulary, <clears throat> For validity, for qualitative research is credibility. You don't use the word validity. How do you do it? Two ways, member check. You send back your findings to the people whom you have interviewed. Show them the draft, tell them what you have written. They will tell you right or wrong, or you missed something or you have misinterpreted. Peer debriefing is you talk with your peers, somebody who is <clears throat> like your colleague, uh, at the university or in your research institution and show them what you have done from the beginning to the end. And they will pinpoint if there are errors to you. So you have to do both member check, uh, which I've done because I was required, and then uh, transferability. There's oftentimes in qualitative research, your findings are not transferable. It's limited to what you have found, but you have to show that your research findings are consistent. This is an actual <clears throat> part of my publication, a sample of my credibility I was required. The editor in chief sent my paper back to me, but this is now published. You have to do member check. So I did. I said my member check was conducted in two stages. The first stage was conducted when I was in Ukraine doing my ethnographic <clears throat> research. The second stage was when I came back uh, to Thailand. And the purpose of the member check was to ensure that my findings are accurate and uh, really reflects what they told me. Okay, so this is the purpose of member check. And I actually had to write it. I was required by the journal. In quantitative vocabulary, <clears throat> you use internal validity that what you have, the cause and effect, the variables you use are consistent from the beginning to the end. External validity means, is your paper generalizable? Can you claim that it can be generalized in other situations? Mixed method, you will integrate both qualitative and quantitative. And then you have triangulation. Use as many different sources as you can to confirm that your findings are accurate both quantitative and qualitative. Okay. Ethics, this is the last item, uh, at least five items in research. Number one, uh, you should have informed consent. When you conduct research, people must know you're conducting research, you're interviewing them, or you're asking them to fill out a survey form. Oftentimes you should tell them they can withdraw any time uh, as they wish, with no penalty. <clears throat> that is more or less the vocabulary uh, of informed consent. They should know. And uh, in formal research, you must have a consent form that they sign. Nowadays, it could be typing their name and sending back to you the form because some people don't know how to put the uh, online signature, but typing is acceptable nowadays as long as it came back from their email. <clears throat> okay. uh, sometimes in the questionnaire itself, online, the first part is, do you agree 
to fill out this questionnaire. And if you want to withdraw at any time, you have the right to do so. And then you say, I agree. You just check it. Oftentimes it's already built in when it's in your smartphone. Number two is if people, accept, especially if your questions are sensitive, you should keep the findings confidential. And especially if it will cause harm and you should not, <clears throat> but there's a potential for that, the people should be anonymous. There's an exception. There are three types of uh, uh, ethics. One is uh, expedite or exempt. Exempt, meaning you're interviewing famous people like CEO of Fortune 500 companies. They want to be known. They are known. Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, they want to be published. So those are exempt. Two would be uh, expedite, meaning there's no harm that will happen. Just like regular people in the street, just common uh, person, and that's okay. Third is full board. Full board means if you have pregnant women who are battered uh, by their husband or their mother-in-law, those are very sensitive people. So they should be totally anonymous. They should be protected. Or orphans, <clears throat> those are full board. They need full uh, participation and support. And you need, oftentimes, your institution must have an uh, IRB, <clears throat> Institutional Review Board, a, a group of people from different faculty who will meet and look at your proposal and sign whether it is exempt expedite or full board. It's the same in the US where I got my doctorate and it's the same in Thailand. Uh, those are the three categories. I don't know about India, Nepal uh, and other countries. <clears throat> Maybe it's a little different. And then do no harm is very critical. Make sure uh, you tell the people who are filling out your form or you'll interview, uh, you do not intend to do harm. And in the event, that harm can happen, you could say, uh, my university has a clinic or infirmary that will give you free medical or psychological attention upon my recommendation. So you have to provide like services. For instance, if your university has that, then tell them if you feel trauma, let me know. Uh, that's not my intention, but my university has faculty members who can give you therapy or there is psychologist or counselor, or if you need psychiatrist, depending on your institution, if they can do those things. Okay. And oftentimes in many journals, at the end, you would say there's no conflict of interest, especially if you are, your research is paid by big pharmaceutical company they would expect you to say that their drugs are good. That is conflict of interest. So you have to declare, my research was funded by. This is to show uh, that you are open, you're transparent. Uh, it's not that I, I am saying that their product is good, but it's what the findings reveal. But you have to declare <clears throat> uh, where you're finding your, your uh, funding comes from. And lastly, you have to make sure that your data analysis is correct. You don't misinterpret because you want a certain type of findings to come out, even if it's contrary to what you have found out. Okay, in summary, these are all the different aspects of qualitative and quantitative research, selection of research design, <clears throat> sampling techniques, data collection methods, data analysis techniques, validity and reliability, ethical considerations. And mixed method will be combination of both. This is again, but this is from the web. In conclusion, so explore the endless possibilities and embark on a journey of discovery. Every research that you conduct presents new opportunities to spark innovations, and bring about changes. In addition to academic 
accomplishments, delving into research cultivates personal development and a deep comprehension of your chosen field. Thank you.